Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Budget Lockup Experience 2017. Uh, good to see you in the front and uh, those of you who have joined uh, from various organizations taking time out of your day. Thank you uh, for coming. Uh, what follows is a summary of some of the points that I think are worthy of uh, attention in the, uh, the budget that will be tabled formally in a few hours in the Legislative Assembly. And I think you know the format. Uh, you'll have an opportunity then to further digest uh, some of what you've been presented with and what I have to say, and then I'll come back uh, sh shortly thereafter and try to answer uh, some of your questions. As I frequently do, I'm going to begin by giving you an update on where we are, sort of a third quarter update for the, uh, the fiscal year that uh, we are in. We'll start uh, right there. And uh, uh, a few details about this. Uh, starting on the left, starting on the left, you'll see where the uh, anticipated surplus was for the uh, second quarter uh, report. Some of the changes, I can tell you that higher taxation is uh, slightly higher personal income tax, slightly higher corporate income tax, and slightly higher uh, property transfer tax than was anticipated uh, when I did the update in November. Some of you still have, uh, uh, many people have an interest in the property transfer tax and the additional tax I think at the time in November, I suggested to you that we were anticipating um, the foreign transfer tax to come in at, uh, we had a number of 50 million, though I, th I said then I thought it was going to be a little bit higher. We're now forecasting uh, for the fiscal year uh, 100 million for uh, the property transfer tax, the, the extra part of the property transfer tax that applies to foreign purchases. Uh, lower commercial uh, uh, net crown income is uh, uh, virtually all attributable to uh, ICBC and uh, continuing uh, increases in claims costs offset uh, marginally by uh, better revenues uh, than anticipated revenues from uh, the Lottery Corporation and uh, Liquor Distribution Branch. Um, the biggest change is statutory spending for the year, and I'll come to that here in a, uh, in a moment. I don't really have a lot to say, but the bottom line for the present fiscal year is 2.24. Uh, uh, now we're anticipating to be uh, just under 1.5 in terms of a surplus for uh, the existing, for the fiscal year that ends on uh, at the end of March. Uh, in terms of the in terms of the, uh, the changes in that statutory spending, they uh, uh, relate to four areas, uh, emergency uh, management preparedness, uh, flood control accounts for uh, $50 million, uh, forest rehabilitation work uh, is, uh, you may recall the uh, announcement from last week uh, relating to the transfer of funds to the uh, Forestry Enhancement uh, Society to uh, do more preparatory work and try to uh, do more in the way of preventing uh, fire seasons. It wasn't, a, wasn't our worst season last year, but they are uh, happening. Uh, the ferociousness of uh, forest fires are happening uh, uh, yearly now, and we are trying to get ahead of that and do more in the way of uh, uh, preparation uh, and rehab work in the forest, housing and shelters, uh, hear more about this in a moment, but uh, the, uh, in addition to the $500 million uh, that was announced uh, last year, uh, additional uh, monies that have been spent in terms of uh, housing and shelter activities. And uh, the fourth item there, infrastructure investments, you will see, uh, those of you who are looking at the uh, budget documents, just over $300 million, and that relates to ongoing discussions we are having with uh, the federal government uh, about some uh, additional shared infrastructure spending uh, that we are uh, hopeful uh, we'll be able to conclude uh, in the next uh, number of weeks, and uh, that is uh, funds that have been set aside uh, for that purpose. Uh, in terms of the forecasts uh, for 2016, I guess the best thing I can tell you is that we saw a steady improvement through the year from... Uh, from when the, uh, the budget was tabled just over a year ago. Uh, that, of course, will have uh, 
uh, positive consequences for uh, employees uh, for whom we have the, uh, the growth dividend uh, in place where uh, we outperform our economic forecasts and the forecasts of the uh, forecast council. Uh, you can see we are, uh, for 2017, uh, they are predicting uh, growth at 3.1 uh, and we at uh, uh, 3.0. Uh, beyond that, uh, in terms of uh, the years ahead, uh, you can see that we are uh, forecasting continued uh, solid stable growth, but at uh, lower levels. And uh, I'll give you a comparative uh, look at uh, how that stacks us up with other parts of uh, the country, but you can see for the year that we are in now, calendar year 2017, um, the, uh, the forecast council is uh, pegging growth uh, in BC at 2.3. Uh, the other thing I'll emphasize about uh, this is once again, you will see that uh, as is our practice, we have included uh, prudence by downgrading for budgeting purposes uh, what we anticipate the, uh, the level of growth to be to uh, 2.1. Uh, that has served us well in the past and we will continue to follow that, uh, follow that practice. In terms of how we compare with uh, other parts of uh, Canada, uh, we have been uh, the leaders uh, and uh, we, are, uh, we remain at or near the, uh, the top uh, for the year ahead. 15 and 16, we led the country. We believe we will certainly be the leader in uh, 2016. We'll see where we end up in 17. It's the first time I'm told since the early 1960s that British Columbia has led the country uh, two years running. Uh, so we're proud of uh, that fact, uh, but uh, you can see that we uh, continue to chug along and are anticipated to chug along uh, ahead of the, uh, the national average and uh, sort of fighting it out with uh, Ontario. Alberta is uh, bouncing back from uh, negative numbers and I'm sure they will be uh, pleased to see themselves back in positive territory. Uh, it's probably good news for the rest of the country as well. Um, what accounts for our, uh, our record, and, and it has been, uh, in terms of growth, an enviable one, and I frequently comment on the fact that we are distinguishable from other jurisdictions in Canada in a number of ways, but two important ones economically is our diversified domestic economy. Uh, and later I'll talk in, about our diversified trade portfolio. But you see here um, just how diversified uh, we are and how that benefits us when one sector of the economy encounters headwinds or troubles. And, and frequently, and sometimes at a gathering like this, people will ask me, well, you're only, you're only in good shape or you're only balancing the budget or you're only posting surpluses uh, because of X because of the construction sector, or before that it was because of something else. Uh, and in point of fact, one of the things that, that helps us tremendously is this diversification. So when coal prices are down, commodity prices are down, our tech sector uh, has and continues to enjoy uh, tremendous growth, or our agri-food sector, our aerospace sector. And we enjoy the benefit of that uh, to a far greater extent than uh, virtually any other uh, province. You can see uh, our dependency on natural resources uh, at uh, 7% uh, compared to, I think in Alberta, uh, 46, uh, 46%, uh, or sorry, 29%. Uh, and so uh, we, are, uh, we are able to capitalize on the fact that when one part of our economy is, is struggling, uh, another part uh, we hope is able to, uh, to pick up the slack, and we have seen uh, ample evidence of that uh, going forward. In terms of the indicators of our economic performance, I'll go through them uh, relatively uh, quickly for you. Um, this has been a dramatic improvement from, I recall coming to talk to you in, in these years and saying, look, we're, our objective is to do better uh, than, uh, than 0 0.8 or 0.9. Uh, percent, uh, we have over the last number of years uh, done considerably better. And uh, last year alone, uh, over 70,000 uh, jobs created in BC and that uh, leading the nation uh, by a, 
uh, a very wide margin, uh, a 3.2% uh, increase, as it were. And uh, unemployment uh, uh, below where we thought it would be, uh, it's uh, at 6% in uh, 2016, which was down from 6.2 in 2015. On the, uh, the retail sales side, you can see uh, continued strong uh, growth, uh, growth in excess of uh, in, in excess of six and a half percent. We are budgeting uh, uh, or forecasting uh, growth going forward uh, just below four uh, percent. Our uh, retail sales have consistently outperformed uh, our forecast, and we'll see if that uh, happens again. Uh, I thought you might like to see where some of that activity is taking place. Uh, good year for the uh, um, uh, the car dealers, uh, and no, I have not visited one lately. Um, the uh, uh, furnishings, building materials, I think a reflection of what's going on in the construction uh, sector. Uh, the last time we did this, the one that was in negative territory was uh, uh, gas stations, and they seem to have uh, uh, perked up above the uh, uh, above the line. And anyway, you see it's a broad swath of uh, positive numbers on the uh, on the retail side, uh, indicating, uh, I think, a reflection of yes, consumer confidence, but uh, less cross-border shopping, significant increases in tourism. Uh, there's more people in BC, and there's more people working, and all of that's going to translate into uh, healthy uh, retail sales numbers for the, uh, for the province. Uh, on the housing front, uh, we have been tracking at uh, well above our historic average of uh, 29,000 uh, new home starts. Uh, many of you uh, follow this and some of you come from, from agencies uh, who do that uh, on a daily basis. The, the, the one th the thing I thought I could add for you is a little bit of a breakdown, and if people want this, we can get it uh, to you. So in Vancouver, for the period 2007 and 2000, to 2015, so 07 to 15, the average was uh, just under 18,000. For 2016, uh, 28,000, uh, almost 28,000 home starts. In Victoria, uh, just below 1,800 was the average for that, those years. Uh, in 2016, it was almost 3,000. Uh, so you get the idea. Uh, similar in, in Kelowna, out in the eastern Fraser, central eastern Fraser Valley, uh, all uh, well above uh, historic averages in terms of, uh, in terms of home construction, uh, multiple uh, uh, dwelling uh, construction, uh, multiple family uh, dwellings leading the way in that respect. Uh, exports. Now, some of you will recall in 2016 when we were uh, last year in this period, and I was very, very troubled by this because our dependency uh, in British Columbia on trade and continuing to uh, send products to uh, other markets uh, is, is significant, and it's, uh, as I said earlier, in my view, uh, largely... Uh, responsible for the success we've had. So when this started to flatten out, um, you may recall I, uh, I pointed to that as a potentially very uh, troubling sign. Now, what's happened? It has uh, rocketed uh, upward at levels that uh, we really didn't anticipate uh, that we would see, uh, almost 13%, in fact. So you're, I'm probably guilty of, some of you will say, crying wolf. The problem right now is, um, for reasons that I'll talk about and you're aware, what's going on in the US. Um, I hope this isn't a temporary blip uh, and we see that uh, line come down uh, just as uh, sharply. It's a good number, uh, but I am uh, concerned about uh, the the rising tide of protectionism, uh, the winds that are blowing, uh, particularly south of the border. In terms of a breakdown by some of the, uh, the leading commodities, I can tell you that uh, for coal, for example, the, uh, the volume and the price and the value of our uh, uh, exports was up. 
but I am told and advised that the, uh, uh, there is anticipations that the price of coal will come back down. There were supply issues in other parts of the world, Australia, that uh, are being rectified, and so we may have to anticipate a decrease in the coal price. Uh, copper, although the uh, uh, copper was uh, down in terms of volume and, and price, but we see the prices uh, coming back uh, somewhat going forward. Uh, natural gas, uh, uh, volumes were up, price was down, but overall value was up uh, as a result of the price uh, being uh, slightly up. And lumber, maybe the, uh, uh, the, the trickiest of them all to forecast uh, today, uh, overall values uh, of exports were up, uh, overall volumes of exports uh, were up, and the price was up. The question is, how long is that going to continue, particularly uh, with respect to the North American market? And uh, many of you heard what uh, the Canadian ambassador to uh, Washington and Mr. Emerson had to say uh, last week. And uh, yes, we are uh, uh, tracking that very, very carefully. Um, now, what is, uh, in terms of strategizing uh, uh, around that, uh, I do take a measure of pride, and the government does, in pointing out just how dramatically uh, different our exposure to the U.S. is versus um, other provinces in Canada, Alberta and uh, uh, Ontario. But we are still exposed. I mean, we shouldn't kid ourselves. It's still the biggest part of our market. And if that trade gets uh, interrupted, uh, it's going to have an impact. Uh, it's going to have an impact on us. Now, we've taken some steps uh, to address that. The lumber sector should be uh, very proud of having led the way in terms of opening up uh, new markets in places like uh, China. The number I saw uh, for a year or two ago was that... Uh, 65, uh, just how dramatically uh, uh, over the span of 15 years um, our lumber shipments to, uh, to China uh, have increased. And uh, you know, that's, that's good news, uh, good news for us. We account for, the last number I saw was not 50, but close to 60% uh, of Canada's uh, softwood lumber shipments uh, to the U.S. So having other markets. We're seeing progress in, uh, in India. Uh, Six million in 2016, which was up from $100,000 worth of softwood lumber. So we're starting to make some inroads. Got a long ways, uh, got a long ways to go there. Uh, quickly... Uh, just in terms of the overall outlook uh, for the economy, the line I tend to focus on uh, for this one uh, is here. So, you know, you've got the U.S. What was being forecast in January uh, of last year for growth in 2017? What was being forecast in August of last year? And what was being forecast last month? As you go through the list of jurisdictions, U.S., Canada, China, Japan, Virtually all of them are either going down or uh, stagnant. Uh, Japan shows some very modest improvement, but they didn't have a lot, uh, a lot of room to go uh, down much further. But there's not a lot of optimism out there uh, in the jurisdictions that we call customers. And so we have to be alive uh, to that in terms of uh, planning, strategizing, and, and the forecasting that, uh, uh, that we do. And, you know, the U.S. is a bit of a wild card right now in terms of what's going to happen uh, to their economy uh, and what's going to happen at the border. And you've all seen the same reports uh, that I have in, uh, in that respect. So let's uh, carry on then to uh, how that translates into, uh, into a budget uh, going forward. In terms of the bottom line, we, uh, I told you about how we get uh, to 1.45 for the fiscal year soon to end. Uh, going forward, uh, we are anticipating uh, a fifth uh, consecutive uh, surplus budget and uh, surpluses uh, that, uh, again, I would characterize as modest but plausible. I've always thought that we should be planning at, uh, and targeting uh, in excess of uh, uh, 200 million. That's another, I suppose, uh, 
degree or layer of uh, prudence that I try to uh, work into the, uh, the budgeting uh, process. Uh, but that's what we have uh, going forward. I can tell you that there are, in addition to the, uh, the forecast allowance, allowances, contingencies of uh, 400 million uh, and then 300 million in the out years uh, that form part of, uh, form part of the, uh, the fiscal plan. Uh, and in terms of some of the, uh, the things that you'll be looking uh, uh, and I'd want to highlight, uh, our, our operating debt, uh, you can see, continues to uh, decline and we are now uh, at the end of the fiscal plan if we adhere to uh, the targets that we have set for ourselves and we have a, uh, a pretty good record uh, of achieving uh, those targets, we will have the, uh, the lowest operating debt uh, uh, at any time since 1982 uh, and within our grasp is the total elimination of the operating debt for the first time since 1975, uh, an, ach an achievement uh, to be sure. Um, If we go to the other traditional uh, measurements of uh, debt affordability, uh, you can see the, uh, the debt to GDP uh, ratio, which is uh, uh, tracking along at uh, very comfortable. Uh, this is where we were uh, back in, uh, uh, back in the 15-16 uh, uh, budget, and we had uh, targeted getting to 15.9. Uh, to uh, we are uh, uh, getting there uh, earlier uh, than we thought we would. So that's good news. On the, uh, the debt to revenue uh, front, uh, you'll see that is tracking upwards. I will say this, that is uh, probably the top end of where we're gonna allow ourselves or want to allow ourselves to get in terms of uh, the debt to revenue matrix uh, because beyond, uh, beyond 95, uh, we begin to put our AAA credit rating at risk and we have no intention of uh, doing that. And so, uh, um, you will see us paying particularly close attention to the, uh, the debt to revenue uh, numbers. In terms of uh, growth in spending and, uh, uh, and expenses, you can see that the, uh, the solid line continues to uh, flow above the, uh, the dotted line, which is a, a good place uh, to be. Uh, growth uh, uh, revenue tracking at 2.3, uh, expense at the moment uh, 2.4, and you can see, uh, you see the, the bump here, by the way, in the, the fiscal year that we've uh, we're just in the, uh, the midst of uh, closing out. Uh, healthy infrastructure spending uh, in the fiscal plan uh, in terms of taxpayer supported infrastructure, infrastructure uh, almost 14 billion over the, uh, the life of the plan. You can see from the, uh, the chart how it is um, uh, parceled out. Some of you may have questions and there's material in the, uh, uh, the budget. Uh, about some of the projects that that includes. There's a table in there, the over $50 million uh, table. I can't remember which one it is, but uh, uh, you can uh, track, and there are some new projects uh, that have been added uh, to that uh, list, things like the uh, Royal Inland uh, Hospital and uh, others. When you roll in, uh, uh, when you roll in uh, the... Uh, uh, Self-supported uh, capital investment, uh, that number becomes uh, 24.5 billion over the uh, life of the fiscal plan, and uh, that includes uh, uh, BC Hydro, obviously Site C, and would also include uh, the George Massey uh, Bridge uh, project uh, once you roll in the, uh, the self-supported uh, uh, capital investment that is uh, taking place. Uh, it is certainly record levels of capital investment. How does that translate on the, uh, the overall debt front for taxpayer supported debt? You see uh, a couple of things in this chart. Uh, first of all, contrary to what a lot of people uh, may have thought or think, you'll see that for 1617, taxpayer supported debt uh, in total is actually decreasing uh, year over year from uh, where it was. Um, you see in the red the uh, um, direct operating debt continuing to, uh, to reduce to uh, where it will be at the end of the, uh, the fiscal plan and our expectation that in the following year it will disappear uh, altogether. Uh, and uh, in terms of how that uh, positions us vis-a-vis -vis, uh, other uh, jurisdictions in Canada, 
I, I would say this, and I do emphasize this. We track this very carefully, and uh, we're proud of how we compare to uh, other jurisdictions. I got a, 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 some data uh, the other day. If I had put, if I had put Alberta uh, beside us, which, as you know, uh, for many, many years boasted the fact that they were at virtually zero, uh, by next year, um, we will be virtually identical. Um, Alberta is rapid, uh, rapidly rising, uh, and ours uh, stable and continuing to uh, to drop uh, marginally. So uh, we're well positioned. The other uh, the other thing that I try to emphasize to uh, um, British Columbians and and others, and it relates to uh, this next uh, bit. You can see. I mean, we are squarely now the along with Canada, the, the AAA uh, outlier. And people, they say, oh, I know you always say that, De Young. The, the reason I say it is because if we had Ontario's debt to GDP ratio for our economy, and if we had their credit rating, you could take over $2 billion out of the budget and send it to the banks, because that's what our debt servicing costs would be. So it is not just for bragging rights. It is because we get to make way more positive choices by hanging on to our AAA credit rating and trying to manage as responsibly as we can. Imagine what the budget would look like with $2 billion, more than $2 billion ripped out of it uh, and dedicated to, to debt servicing costs. OK, um, in terms of the, uh, the budget, uh, the budget itself, um, I would summarize and characterize it uh, this way, folks. We are endeavoring to marshal that fiscal strength that I've uh, described to you. Uh, we are trying to uh, ensure that we are providing the funding uh, and the support necessary to, uh, to families, to government services, uh, particularly in areas where the need is greatest and where there has been some uh, pressure. Uh, as well, we are uh, endeavoring to return uh, some of that uh, uh, fiscal, some of the benefits of that fiscal strength to BC families uh, themselves. So you see here in terms of uh, children, families, and those in need, the, uh, the investments that are taking place, uh, uh, the education sector, the education K-12 ministry, I'll come back to this in a moment, almost three quarters of a billion dollars uh, additional uh, on the home, uh, uh, home support, home support, housing affordability uh, front, uh, uh, significant ongoing uh, investment uh, there. The BC Tech strategy, tech having been uh, just a tremendous success story uh, for all of British Columbia, but here we are in southern Vancouver Island and uh, uh, particularly uh, true here and uh, additional monies for uh, parks and, uh, uh, parks and uh, environmental uh, protection uh, strategies. If we uh, Go to the uh, the first of those uh, categories. Uh, you see the breakdown for uh, uh, support services for uh, uh, vulnerable youth, uh, special needs. Uh, you heard on Friday about the increase uh, to uh, disability rates uh, that is included in the uh, budget to take effect on uh, on April the first of this year. Uh, we want to ensure that there is sufficient. Uh, fiscal wherewithal within the, uh, the relevant social ministries to deal with increased caseload pressures. Yes, we are seeing uh, more people coming to BC from parts of the country that are not enjoying the same level of economic uh, prosperity, and that is putting pressure on, um, pr putting pressure on uh, caseloads. And uh, uh, as well, uh, an investment to create uh, an additional 2,000 uh, home care uh, spaces to add to the uh, the 13,000 that we have uh, targeted uh, earlier uh, as part of our uh, as part of our uh, uh, plan and initiative around uh, home care. Um, on the uh, K to 12 education uh, front, uh, you will see that we are including uh, additional monies uh, to protect uh, and maintain rural schools. Uh, to ensure that people don't have to pay for the busing that their children need to get uh, 
to school in more rural areas of the province. The one I really want to focus on, though, uh, because I expect there would be questions. So what you will see in the budget documents as a line item is, uh, over the life of the fiscal plan, the, uh, the cost associated with the interim agreement uh, that has been reached with the BCTF. That is not a final agreement. We understand that. I understand that. Uh, there is money within the, uh, the budget uh, to address the, uh, the ongoing uh, negotiations that are taking place, but it is a negotiation. And uh, I will say again, I, I thought it would be inappropriate for me to stand here and tell you uh, while those negotiations are ongoing that here's how much it's going to cost. Uh, the cost will be determined by the negotiation. I'm told that uh, the discussions are uh, productive uh, at the moment, and uh, the parties are, are hopeful about uh, reaching a settlement, uh, and there will be, uh, there are uh, monies in the fiscal plan to uh, ensure that that final settlement can be, uh, can be financed. On the uh, housing affordability uh, uh, front, uh, you know about the uh, unprecedented level of investment that has taken place uh, thus far, and it really is unprecedented. Uh, over uh, over 5,000 uh, units of housing for a, a wide range in partnership with, uh, with groups and uh, uh, different agencies, uh, some the private sector, some uh, governmental, and uh, as well the BC Home Partnership that is uh, already providing uh, uh, dramatic uh, support, significant support to uh, first-time home buyers uh, looking to uh, get into the, uh, the market. Uh, we think it'll be upwards of 42,000 uh, families that uh, first-time home buyers that uh, benefit. Um, and as well, I can tell you today that for first-time home buyers, additional relief with respect to the property transfer tax, the threshold for exemption, total exemption, was 475. Uh, it is now going up to $500,000. Uh, to be totally exempt from the payment of the property transfer tax on uh, uh, for a new uh, purchase by a uh, first-time purchase by a family. Uh, health. When I got here in 94, anyone remember what the health budget was in 94? Six billion. In the relatively short time that I have been around here. Uh, I mean, by the end of the fiscal plan, it'll be 20 billion. So I, I mean, I'm, I only offer that because there are lots of things to be critical of and the choices we make. But please don't anyone tell me the healthcare budget's being cut. It's on its way to 20 billion. Now, what I can tell you about this budget is in addition, if we took, if we took the budget amount for the health ministry for 2016 and did a calculation of the cumulative impact, impact of what is being added in for the three next years of the fiscal plan, that would represent an additional $4.2 billion. To be fair, Last year's fiscal plan included increases. It wasn't going to be the same amount for three years. But the increase has been increased. So in addition to the increases that were included in last year's fiscal plan for 2017, 18, 18, 19, um, there is an additional $900 million uh, added to that increase uh, for health in this uh, in this fiscal plan, but there you go. It's uh, uh, it is a huge part of the budget uh, this year. Forty-one percent. Oh, I should say this. Um, some of you may not have heard me say this. When the agreement was signed uh, with Ottawa on Friday, um, the uh, the revenues associated with that are not in your budget documents. They they had been printed, quite frankly, by then. So um, uh, when we do the uh, or. That's a little bit presumptuous. When there is a first quarter update uh, this summer, uh, the, uh, the results of that uh, agreement or the, the fiscal consequences of that agreement will uh, be built into the, uh, uh, the plan. It's obviously uh, upside 
um, upside adjustments uh, in a variety of uh, areas. We uh, are seeking to uh, allocate and target uh, uh, additional funding uh, in mental health, particularly uh, with respect to, uh, to young people. Uh, and you see the, uh, the investments uh, that are uh, uh, budgeted for going forward uh, with respect to, uh, with respect to uh, mental health. Which uh, then takes us to the, uh, the part of the budget, I suppose, that garnered uh, a lot of uh, attention, and that is the question of uh, giving back and what mechanism would the uh, government choose to do so, having made the decision uh, to return um, some, uh, some funds, some revenues to uh, taxpayers, or I guess more to the point, leave it with them uh, in the first place. And the, the instrument, the mechanism uh, we have chosen is uh, medical services plan uh, premiums. And by now, most of you will uh, have leafed through your material and know that uh, we are uh, instituting a dramatic cut uh, in, uh, in premiums as part of a strategy to uh, ultimately eliminate them altogether, and that is the objective. Uh, what we can afford to do uh, today is to cut in half the premiums uh, that households earning less than $120,000 uh, are paying. Two million British Columbians won't pay any MSP, another two million uh, will have their uh, premiums uh, cut in half, and in virtually all instances, save and except one, and the examples are contained in your budget book uh, in a chart, uh, people, families will be uh, paying rates uh, that are comparable to those that were set in 1992. The uh, uh, the two charts I have for you relate to the impact of this decision. Uh, and by the way, yes, it starts on uh, January the 1st of uh, 2018. Uh, for the individual earning uh, 25,000, uh, he or she will no longer pay any MSP premiums. Uh, for the person uh, earning 30,000, uh, theirs will be reduced by uh, over $200. I mean, you can go through it until the, the person uh, in the in the sixty uh, to one hundred and twenty thousand dollar range, sees their uh, rates cut in half from nine hundred to four hundred and fifty dollars for a uh, family uh, with a couple of kids, all the way up to three, thirty five thousand dollars. They're not paying any MSP premiums uh, any longer, and you see the uh, the savings uh, at the various uh, uh, income levels along the way uh, until you get to the point where that family, and there are many of them. Uh, will be saving uh, $900. Uh, so the cumulative impact of that, coupled with the fact that for the uh, remaining uh, households who earn excess of 120000 we have frozen uh, the rates, uh, translates into uh, foregone revenue or monies that remain with British Columbians uh, of over a billion dollars. And uh, that is the, uh, the instrument by which uh, mechanism by which we have uh, chosen to uh, return to British Columbians the benefits of our uh, strong economy and strong balance sheet. Uh, some of you will recall that we uh, commissioned the uh, uh, Tax Commission on uh, competitiveness in uh, the past year. They came back with some recommendations, um, most of which related to, some of which related, good chunk of which related to the, uh, the PST. One of those recommendations highlighted the fact that British Columbia was the only province charging PST on uh, electricity. Um, we have uh, decided to address that uh, in, uh, in this budget and over uh, uh, in a two-phase, uh, uh, two-step uh, approach, we'll be uh, reducing and ultimately eliminating the uh, PST chargeable on electricity. It's about $164 million in foregone revenue. It breaks out um, small business about 50 million, um, larger businesses uh, about 51 million, and large industrial users uh, just under 
uh, 50 million. There's a, actually a positive impact for the government itself uh, to uh, around that. As well, um, the small business corporate income tax rate will drop by half a point to two uh, percent. We will have the second lowest uh, corporate uh, small business uh, corporate income tax rate in the country after Manitoba, whose uh, rate is zero. Uh, beyond that, uh, a variety of uh, a few more initiatives that I uh, I thought I would. Uh, I thought I would highlight uh, for you in terms of economic development and uh, uh, rural, uh, rural support and uh, initiatives. Connectivity remains uh, a priority. The, uh, uh, some uh, additional funding for economic development on Vancouver uh, Island. The $6 million for the Buy Local program will become a permanent feature of the agriculture uh, budget. Uh, we are as part of our uh, strategy around uh, market diversification, continuing to aggressively uh, uh, promote our presence in partnership with the private sector, particularly in, uh, in Asia and ASEAN and uh, South Asian uh, countries. And uh, you see the, uh, the reference uh, here. And in the past, you have heard me uh, talk about uh, our uh, supports and partnerships with the aerospace and uh, shipping uh, sector and uh, that will continue uh, into the, uh, the future. In terms of uh, the environment, uh, we, uh, uh, the, uh, the park strategy, uh, including the hiring of more park rangers, the establishment of 1,900 uh, more uh, campsites, uh, the Mines and Energy, Energy and Mines Ministry uh, receiving additional uh, resources, money to uh, hire the people they need for uh, additional permitting and oversight capacity. Uh, the Caribou uh, Recovery uh, Program, this is a, uh, a part of the uh, environmental uh, landscape that uh, continues to, uh, uh, to struggle and uh, providing additional resources uh, there we thought was important, uh, invasive plant management it's, someone asked me about the, uh, uh, about the SPCA. I couldn't decide where to put that one, so don't anyone be uh, confused or uh, offended, but we have a, uh, a partnership uh, that has been, uh, I think, well-received to ensure that uh, communities have the reasonable facilities via the SPCA to uh, uh, look, after, uh, look after animals. And uh, on the climate leadership plan, you see the, uh, I mentioned earlier, the uh, Forest Enhancement Society uh, work, uh, the Clean Energy Vehicle Program, and the Forest Carbon Initiative, all uh, uh, funded as part of, uh, uh, part of this budget. So, uh, finally, uh, I'll end where I think I began, which is by saying we are proud of the fact that uh, BC has led Canada that our balance sheet is the envy of uh, uh, the nation and uh, our economic performance uh, is the envy of the nation. And we have sought to ensure that British Columbians um, realize the benefits of that because they're the ones that made it happen. And uh, we wanted to ensure that uh, we were funding the services that British Columbians need uh, certainly health care, but also in other areas like child protection uh, to address some of the areas of, of pressure uh, to ensure that uh, Grand Chief Ed John's uh, recommendations are, are acted upon. Uh, we wanted to do that and are pleased that we can uh, without developing or creating a deficit for our kids and grandkids to inherit. We wanted to reduce the burden uh, facing uh, British Columbia uh, families uh, and have done so by addressing um, a, an instrument that uh, attracted um, a lot of, uh, has attracted a lot of negative uh, comment by virtue of the fact that we were the only province uh, with a, an MSP in the form that we had in BC. And we also wanted to ensure that we continued to construct the infrastructure that our growing uh, economy, uh, nation leading economy, uh, requires to, uh, to go uh, forward. And all of that we wanted to do uh, whilst at the same time uh, maintaining uh, a responsible balance sheet uh, and our debt uh, metrics 
and preserving our AAA credit rating. Uh, and uh, we are uh, optimistic and uh, believe that we have accomplished uh, those objectives. And I uh, thank you for your attention and we'll uh, return for some of your questions uh, momentarily. Thank you.